Good evening. We'll be in Psalm 8 tonight, as we just sang. Thanks to Sam for leading that song. Psalm 8. Give you a minute to get there. I want to give everybody time because once we get there, we're going to leave there in thought, keep the pages there, but leave there in thought to a different biblical scene. Psalm 8. Once you have Psalm 8, do me a favor and look up. Above me, up. (laughs) Up there. Look up and feel your pupils dilate in fear. There's a throne bigger than anything you've you've ever imagined, way up there. And on that throne, there's, there's this figure that is pure brightness. Brighter than anything you've ever seen or dreamed or feared. And in fact, it's, it's impossible even to see this figure. Not, not just because of his brightness, but because of his, his billowing. Because there's smoke all around this room. It's, it's spreading out from this figure. Now, all of a sudden, this figure speaks. But you, you can't make out anything that, that he's saying because his, his voice is so, so stunning and royal and otherworldly. All you know is that at that moment when he speaks... Everything shakes. The room, you, everything that, that you thought to be real, it's, it's shaking, just like that. And it, it speaks to the, the awesomeness of this scene. That it's now, finally, at this moment, that you realize that there are these, these really weird-looking creatures flying all around you. And they're calling out to one another a message that somehow seems to to make some sense of this entire scene. The message is this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, that's the throne room scene from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. But it presents a natural transition in thought to Psalm 8 and verse 1. The psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. So this this figure on the throne, this God, this, this Lord times two, O Lord, our Lord, he is king over all creation. We can see his his royal power on display everywhere. Up, down, all around, it's it's there, his royal power. And in fact, the psalmist takes that first line, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And if you look at verse 9 of Psalm 8, he repeats it word for word. Now, why would the psalmist repeat himself? Well, he seems to be making use of a literary device called an inclusio, which basically is just a signal to the reader that whatever is in between those two phrases is bracketed by those two phrases. So everything in between that first line and last line of this psalm should work to prove those identical lines, to show how and and why and, and where they are actually true. So that's what this whole psalm is about. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Everything in between those phrases works to prove that point. It's it's like if I said something like, 
Hitler is the worst human in the history of humans. And then I, I go on to say, um, here's why, right? He murdered six million Jews just because of their Jewish lineage. He murdered three million other people because he was racist and he looked down on people with disabilities. Um, also, he kind of ruined mustaches for everyone, <laughs> everywhere of all time, right? So, in conclusion, Hitler is the worst human in the history of humans. Now, what, what did I do there? I started with that same phrase and ended with it. And that signaled to you, the listener, that everything in between those phrases was working to prove that phrase, right? Now, it's the same here in Psalm 8. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So the rest of the psalm is about that one truth. And we can see that, for example, in verse 2 of Psalm 8. Out of the mouth of, out of, the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So from the most unlikely of places, from, from the mouths of babies, the Lord forms a stronghold. He forms a fortress. This, this Hebrew word translated strength can, can just mean strength or it can refer to a literal stronghold or a fortress. So God takes the, the babbling of these babies, their, their pitiful cries for help. Because what else does a baby cry for, right? It cries out for food, for rest, for, for water. It's crying out because it can't help itself. It's helpless. So he takes that that pitiful, helpless cry, and he uses it to stop these these violent enemies right in their tracks. That's how powerful this God is. And not only can he do that, but then verse 3, when I look at your heavens, when I look at the sky, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. The psalmist says, I look up and I see how great my God is. But then verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? So I look up at the skies, and I see the works of your fingers, and I'm just, I'm just blown away by you, by you, God. And then I look at my fingers. And then I look in the mirror. And I look weird, okay? <laughs> there's, there's no getting around... Some of y'all looked <laughs> agreed too quickly on that. <laughs> there's, there's no getting around the fact that us as human creatures are strange-looking things. We're stinky, some of us more than others. We're loud. We're messy. This, this Hebrew word, there, or there are two different Hebrew words translated man in this verse. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And both of those words, in a special way, emphasize the frailty and mortality and weakness of humanity. It's like, a, it's like in case we needed more of a reminder after we look up at the stars and then look at ourselves and see how small we are, it's like, what is, what is man? It's a little thump. What is the son of man? Another little thump. Just saying, hey, look at how puny you are. That's what it's saying. This verse and, and the last verse begin to reveal to us that this psalm has a backdrop. We'll talk more about that. But the backdrop of this psalm is Genesis chapter 1. If you want to hold your finger here in in Psalm 8 and flip over there, we'll be there in in a few minutes. The backdrop of this psalm is is Genesis chapter 1. The poet is reflecting on the creation narrative from that chapter. And and just like there, here, we, we find this contrast. God has installed the heavenly lights in all of their splendor. He's put them in way up above. And then he comes down here. And if you remember from Genesis chapter 1, what are we made out of? Dirt. Right? You see this contrast. The psalmist is painting the same picture. So that dirt, this dust right here, that's where we come from. That's, that's who we are. That's how special we are. We're dirt creatures with no intrinsic power to offer to God. So, why does he pay attention to us? Why does he care? Why is his mind full of us, as the psalmist says here in Psalm 8, 4? Why? We're nothing. And yet, if flip back to, to Psalm 8. Hold your finger in Genesis 1 if you're over there. Verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 8. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. The, the Elohim, you've heard that Hebrew word before, can mean angels, can mean God. Just translate a heavenly beings here to, to open it up to, to interpretation. Either way, a little lower than, than the angels or a little lower than God himself. You've made him a little lower than that. 
and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You, put, you have put all things under, the, under his feet. And I'll talk more about that in, in a bit, but, but what we've come to here is this, this big, screaming, obnoxious, flashing sign that says this poem, Psalm 8, is a reflection on Genesis chapter 1. If we needed more of a confirmation of that, in verses 7 and 8 here in Psalm 8, the, the psalmist seems almost to quote Genesis 1 and verse 26 in saying that us humans are in charge of, Psalm 8, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Someone said that this, this psalm is Genesis 1 set to music. I really like that. Remember that these psalms were, like this is Israel's song book, right? The book of Psalms is, is Israel's song book. These were sung for them. And on this on this canvas of Psalm 8, he's painting the picture on top of this backdrop of Genesis chapter 1. Because if you're there in Genesis 1, look at verses 26 and 27. This is the climax, the, the culmination of the creation narrative of Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, remember that word, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own, there's the word again, image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So of all the creatures that God has created here in, in Genesis 1, he appoints one to rule over them all, to have dominion over them all, us. But even more than that, if we're trying to read this from the perspective of the original readers, if we're trying to get into the ancient Israelite mindset, we're immediately going to pick up on this word image in this text. Because throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, over and over and over again, we see this word repeated, but in a negative way. Over and over, God commands them, don't have these graven images. Get rid of them. Throw them out, right? Over and over again. Well, why? Why would God care about these, these random images, these statues, because everybody in that time and place knew what that stood for, what they meant. In that age and an area, these kings who, who believed themselves to be gods, this is especially true of the Egyptian kings, the Babylonian kings, Assyrian kings, that's from that time period and in that place, they believed themselves to be gods. And, and when they would conquer a foreign nation, they would set up an image of themselves in that nation, a picture, a statue of themselves, to rule in their place. They, they were representatives of their royal power, right? We've talked about this before. They set up these images in these foreign lands to represent their power. They were their images. So why were the Israelites warned incessantly against these graven images? Because their God already had made his own images, humans. Out of everything he created, humans were his images, they were living statues. They were his, his royal representatives. They, they were living testimonies to his power and majesty and glory. Now, what the psalmist is saying is in light of Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So we have that as, as the pushing up of the humans. We are royal representatives of God himself. But then the psalmist is like, I, I look up there and that looks so awesome. And then I look at me and, and why am I in, in control of this? Why are humans over the earth? Why, why do we rule over the earth? That's what's confounding the psalmist here in, in Psalm 8. He, he's taken these, these dirt creatures, us, and made us rule over everything else. Appointed us as his images. Now that's, that's awesome, but, but there's a problem. And it's an obvious one, but it's also an obnoxious one. And the problem is that since Genesis 1, remember that's, Creation is, is perfect, we might say. It's pristine. It's how God made it. But ever since then, we messed up. Over and over and over again, starting with Adam and Eve, we messed up. As humans, we messed up. How do we, how, we, we need to repeat this over and over again, right? Because we mess up all the time. If you're like me, you mess up every day, and you probably do it multiple times a day. We mess up. And that's so much of what the biblical narrative is all about. Us humans, messing up over and over and over again. It's setting up an alternate kingdom, we might call it. 
where, where we define good and evil on our own terms instead of letting God define good and evil on his terms. We set up this alternate kingdom. We mess up over and over and over again. And because of that, we forfeited our right to rule. There's a really important phrase in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17 that says that death reigned through that one man, through Adam. Death reigned through Adam. So from Adam onward, we no longer reigned in in the way that we were designed to reign. We forfeited that right to rule. And instead, death reigned. Death reigned in our place. As Paul wrote, death reigned through that one man. We gave up our divine right, our divine privilege, our divine responsibility to death. So for us, coming to Psalm 8 today, back in Psalm 8, when we come to this text, we come at it with this tension in our minds. It's inescapable. Because even though God put us up on this pedestal, we know that we don't deserve that because we messed up. And we messed up, and we messed up, and we messed up. We have this tension that lies implicitly behind this text. There's another backdrop beside Genesis chapter 1. And it's our very faulty lives. But when you think about it, isn't that the very point of it all? Because starting in verse 2 of Psalm 8, where God takes the babbling of these babies and forms it into a fortress... We begin to see this pattern with God that becomes a pattern throughout the rest of the biblical text. Just like that, he takes these weak, powerless, dirt creatures and he appoints us over everything. He takes the weak, makes it strong. That becomes a pattern throughout the text because not only do we have those babies, not only do we have the human race, but also when God decides to break into the history of the world and the history of humanity, he does it in the form of a servant. Philippians 2, right? He came in the form of a servant, and he took on the likeness of men. He looked like us, us weird-looking things, right? God comes into humanity, and he looks like us. And he, and he doesn't only look like us, he also acts like us and struggles like us. And not only that, but he comes as a servant. He comes as the lowest of the low on the social ladder. So all of this begins to make sense in light of Colossians 1 and verse 15, where, where Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, what was that word? The image of the invisible God. So Paul picks up on this language that, that starts in Genesis 1, continues in Psalm 8. He picks up on it again in Colossians 1 and verse 15 and says that Jesus came to earth and showed us what it looks like to image God, to rule in his place. And it, it looked totally different than any of us could ever have imagined. Look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. We're we're done in Psalm 8 for tonight, at least reading, so you can flip over to Matthew 21. Jesus comes to this earth, and he shows us what it looks like to rule. But he does it in a way that none of us would ever have guessed, because it doesn't look like this this iron-fisted, beer-bellied monarch banging his fist on the table and saying, hey, Listen to me or else. Obey me or else. It doesn't look like that. Instead, in Matthew 21, we get get a very different picture. Beginning at verse 14, this is getting toward the end, the very end of Jesus' life. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Pause there. Remember that these these are the religious authorities in that culture. If if we're putting it in our terms, these are the the popes, the the bishops, the preachers, the elders, the deacons. These are the religious authorities. And they they see that that this man is accepting praise from these babies as Hosanna to the Son of David. They're, They're crying out, praising him in the place of God. They're indignant, understandably so, because everybody in this room would be. Except there's something different about Jesus, right? He's not just a man. He's the God man. He's both. And so Jesus responds to them. He says, yes, have you never read? Now, remember, these are the religious authorities. Imagine walking up to Dennis, okay? Like, imagine if I just wanted to be a complete jerk. And I walk up to Dennis and I'm like, Dennis, have you ever read your Bible before? (laughs) I'm just like meaning it incredibly seriously. Have you ever even opened a Bible? Now, if I really meant that, that would be incredibly insulting. Because, of course, he's opened a Bible before Now, that's what Jesus is doing. He's going to these religious authorities, and he says, 
have you never read that they could quote this psalm? They could quote like a ridiculous amount of the Bible. Like by 12, they had the Torah memorized, Genesis through Leviticus or Deuteronomy. It's insane. They've read this out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies. Now, where have we read this before? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. He quotes Psalm 8, and he applies that verse to his life, Psalm 8 and verse 2. So when Jesus, the, the image of the invisible God, God himself, comes to earth, it doesn't look like that, that, that spoiled monarch banging the table, demanding obedience or else. No, it looks like a, a financially broke, average-looking Jewish rabbi walking into Jerusalem to give himself up to the enemies of God, accompanied by the acclamation of babbling babies. Notice that contrast. It's this pattern. It's in that weakness, in that shame of being crucified and mocked and spit on. It's in that humanity that God shows us what power really looks like. Because just like in Psalm 8, God uses that weakness to accomplish his great purposes. In this case, God uses this this beaten, battered, murdered image of himself to reinstate a new humanity, to open up the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15, because Paul picks up this this same idea in 1 Corinthians 15 and, and once again quotes from Psalm 8. So God takes this this image of himself that's weak in this moment and he uses that image to defeat death. Remember that death has reigned over humanity ever since Adam, ever since the fall of Genesis 3. And God takes that weakness and overcomes death. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, and I wish we could read this whole chapter because it it fits so well to this, this discussion. But we're going to begin in verse 21. You'll see that some of the themes we've been talking about are going to be picked up here by Paul. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 15. For as by a man came death, that was Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. There's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, there's the reign of death, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. There's the victory over death by Jesus. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So Christ was resurrected first, at his coming, us, if we belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. There's that kingdom that he founded. The kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign. Now what have we been talking about? We were made to reign. Death reigns. Now who reigns? He must reign. Until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now, if you remember from Psalm 8, there's that phrase again. Psalm 8, verse 6. He's put all his enemies under his feet. The next phrase, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. The one that's reigned from Genesis 3 to here. For, and here he quotes Psalm 8 directly, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. That's Psalm 8 in verse 6. So we messed up in a grand, spiritual, cosmic sense. Psalm 8 and verse 6 couldn't apply to us anymore. We didn't have everything in subjection under our feet. Death reigned over us. We messed up. We failed at our calling. But then Jesus. But then God. But then the good news comes along and it reverses that process. In in God's infinite wisdom, look at Ephesians 1, because this is just a few pages over probably from, from 1 Corinthians 15. This is, this is awesome. Paul is tying together all these themes. In God's infinite wisdom, he decided that the best way to crown the king of everything was for that king to be crucified, for him to give himself up for others, and then, and only then, to be exalted to his throne. You see that phrase over and over and over again, that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God, that throne where we started tonight from Isaiah 6. Now, Ephesians 1 gives us a picture behind the scenes, as it were, of that. Beginning in verse 19, and Paul is praying for these Christians that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. So, he's saying that God has his power working in us, 
And his example is, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, right at that throne, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And here it is. And he put all things under his feet. There's Psalm 8. It's this uniquely Christian redefinition of true power as weakness used by God. And that's the message for us. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that God chose what is foolish in the world to confound the wise, and he chose what is weak in the world to confound, to confound the strong. There's a link in the pattern. In 2 Corinthians 12, Remember that Paul has this thorn in the flesh and he's begging God. He says, I prayed over and over and over again that God would take this thorn in the flesh away from me. But what was God's response? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Well, then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God redefines what true power is. And as the omnipotent one, as the one who is all-powerful, he's the only one who really can. Because what emerges in in the study of this psalm is that this nine-verse psalm, one of 150 psalms in the middle of this, this big old book called the Bible, this psalm plays a crucial role in actually connecting the story of the entire Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Because in the book of Revelation, we see the story completed. If we're taking this into our lives, if we're taking this message of the weakness, the the babies, the humans, the Jesus, exalted, babies become a fortress, the cry becomes a fortress, we become the rulers of the earth, Jesus is exalted, everything is under his feet. If we're taking that pattern and applying it to us today, because God is still at work today, just as he always has been, let's start... Uh, for me, I like to think of it in terms of, um, you know, we, no, we naturally tend to think that we are the center of, of the universe. Right? I do that. You probably do too. So let's start away from us and we'll work to us. So if we're looking out, let's start at a cosmic level, a universal level. Well, that's what the story of the Bible is really all about. Because it starts in a garden, Genesis 1, this perfect, pristine garden. We mess up and then fast forward to the end or to the climax of it all. Jesus wins. He defeats death dethrones death. And then when you get to Romans 8, it tells us that the world is rotting away, right? It's corrupted. So this world that we live in is corrupted. This cosmic, this is a cosmic uh, viewpoint, universal. This world is corrupted. And then we get this picture when we get to Revelation of a new heaven and a new earth. Second Peter 3, the same thing, a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. So it's this, it's this big old story where we take the weakness of Romans 8, the weakness of this corrupted earth, and God transforms it into this new heaven and a new earth that's better than it ever was before. So that's cosmic. Now, let's move into the theoretical. Um, that's, that's all biblical, but let's move into applying it into our world. Let's look at our country. Now, we're not citizens of America, firstly. Well, Philippians 3.20, we're citizens of a nation that's above. We're citizens of heaven, right? So, that's a big old application point. If my main identification is a citizen of America, then I'm missing what God has for me. I'm a citizen of his country, of his kingdom. That's a side note. Now, as, as our country, in, in, in our world, so we're, we're at our world, we move down to our country. In our country, that is so dark at the moment, it seems, where you have day after day after day, it seems like more and more and more darkness is just spreading over our country. Now, what do we learn from this pattern? We learn that God can take the darkest of places, the the weakest of things, and transform it. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to do that for our country, but I'm saying that if we don't believe that he can, then we don't know our God well enough. Because he can take that, the darkest of worlds, and transform it, as he's going to do to our world eventually. That's at a country level. Let's talk about it at a city level. There's a lot of crime in Little Rock. There there are a lot of bad people in Little Rock. 
in some ways, it's a dark city. I'm sure if you've lived here, you've experienced the darkness of this city, just like people in every city experience the darkness of their city, right? In some ways, it's a dark city. But God can take the darkness of our city and transform it to be a light on a hill. Same thing with our church. God can take whatever darkness we have here, God can take our unbelief and transform it into something that helps change our city's darkness. We can become that light on a hill because God can take the weakness of us, a hundred or so people, working with other people, other of God's people in our area, and he can transform our city, our country, our world. And the same is true, we finally get to the center of my life and of yours. Because if we learn anything from this story of how God takes this financially broke, average-looking Jewish carpenter and plot twist, he's your king and he's mine, whether we want it or not. If he can do that, then he can take the darkness that is in my life. And God knows, and you probably know, that it's too much. It's in my life, that's in yours. And he can transform that. He can shine his light into our hearts, as 2 Corinthians 4 says, and make us into amazing vessels of his in this dark world. So what we learn from Psalm 8 is that God can take me, even me, and he can change the world. And he can do the same thing through you, whether you believe it or not. Tonight, if you have something that you need to make right publicly, won't you do it as we stand and as we sing?